hear you. Perfect. Okay. Um, just setting a bit of a timer so I know how much time I have. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, so uh, today I'll be talking about gender in conversational AI. Uh, my name is Lorena Vargas. I'm from Torreón, Coahuila, Northeast Mexico. And I'm a UX and conversation designer. And I'm also involved in Women in Voice as a lead, which I'll explain a bit later. Also, here's my LinkedIn if you have any questions afterwards or we just want to connect. Before I start, just a little tip. If you have an Alexa device <laughs> like this, um, you might want to mute it because I may bring up the name um, a couple of times and I don't want to wake up any of them. Um, okay, and what I mean by conversational AI is uh, conversational artificial intelligence, which is this area subset uh, within the field of AI that enables human to talk with robots. This can be in the form of voice bots, chat bots, etc. Uh, for the sake of this talk, to keep it simple, I'm going to say bots, but um, it's like conversational AI agents. Um, and conversational technology uh, has been on the rise, especially for the past years. We've seen it on our phones, our households, um, in different forms of interface around us. But the idea of people communicating with machines is definitely not a new thing. We all grew up with the notion that one day we'll have robots around us that will do tasks for us and have super abilities or maybe even like take over the world, etc. cetera. So, um, and it is not that science fiction writers were necessarily fortune tellers or that they were able to see the future. But what they did was that they learned from their present and they create a vision based on that. And it's quite interesting how this reality, this present can shape um, fiction, but then fiction shapes back reality. So we see this example, for example, uh, where we have the, the typical 60s uh, housewife doing this chores. And then the, we have the Rosie from the Jetsons that replicates that in this, like, which is now like retro futuristic. But of course, she's a, him, she's a female that's helping out in this domestic chores because women were the ones taking care of this in the back in the 60s. So it's no, no surprise that when we go to the present date, we have the Roomba, which is by name at least female in a way. Um, so yeah, if, we're, if we are used from the media or from certain stereotypes or or tasks associated such as like subservient or secretarial or administrative tasks that are automated in the form of like women, we're likely to drag those gender stereotypes along with us to the present. So is, as you see, uh, we're, we're having all this assistance that the default voice is female, like the Alexa, Google Assistant, et cetera. We have the, the household um, devices as well. Even this like super extreme humanizations or like just demonstrations of, of, of technology such as Sophia, which are inspired by a lot of what we see in, in, in media. But then why is it that a lot of this human-like tech is becoming mostly female? So we need to assess which of values are still applying today if it's something that's Coming, kind of coming from the past and it's in constant changing. Uh, is it because we feel safer with the female bots than with this other Terminator type of bots? Do we believe that female dominated tasks are easier and therefore more likely to be automated? So we need to check, check in on whatever bias is it, it is that we're carrying towards gender because one way or the other, it's gonna end up reflecting in the technology that we create. And we all have a bias, no matter how, how conscious, it, it, it's still somewhere. So let's talk about some mistakes that we often make. So one mistake would be making bots female just for the sake of it. We're used to seeing female bots. So if I'm coming up with a new bot, I'll go like, oh, well, I'll make another girl bot. As things become more humanized, we tend to put human properties into them, such as gender. Like bots don't need a gender per se, but we tend to do that to give them a more robust personality or 
um, so we can identify more with them. How do we assign gender to these bots? By giving them a name that sounds um, potentially female or male. We give them a body. There's some physical, um, so if it's like a physical device, it can have some shapes and nuances, um, or even with an avatar or some visual support, a voice and a personality. It's all, so it's sometimes in the way that the bot talks that you can tell which ones they're leaning towards. So for example, here you have an, like, let's say this avatar or hi, I'm Cortana. Maybe you haven't heard Cortana, but you know that it's a uh, she Cortana, right? And we also have this, um, for, but for example, it's not, um, bots don't necessarily have to have a gender. You can make a gender neutral. For example, um, BBVA, this bank spot is called blue and it doesn't have this, um, this explicit gender. So the thing is we need to be able to justify why we choose to add a gender and why we choose to make it female without falling into stereotypes. So for example, let's say if I, if I say, well, my bot will be female because women are just nicer, that's a stereotype. But if I say, well, my bot will be female because I'm, let's say I'm doing uh, automating conversations for healthcare. And research shows that women are more comfortable disclosing their health status with another woman. So then that's a strong case for uh, us giving bots a gender. And how do we address it? Well, as I mentioned, we can make it some form of gender neutral or combine uh, different the name with the image and, and kind of mix it up a bit. We need to make a solid case. We need to be able to, to justify if if it's uh, if it's if it has a gender, we need to be able to well, sustain it with research, um, and also we need to train that sensitivity. Realize when we're falling into stereotypes. Women, of course, are probably more sensitive to these stereotypes because we're the ones that are misportrayed often. So having a woman involved is always a good um, a good way to go. There's even a, a feminist bot framework that was um, that was designed. It's also and it's in Spanish and English if you want to just type it. So it kind of um, helps with justifying this bot's persona and and also making sure that it falls into like the feminist type of tech. Another mistake would be um, prioritizing likability over dignity because bots can be abused too. So here's the thing, the bot needs to be trusted and trust is sometimes earned by being likable. But likability can mean being funny, warm, like lighthearted, cheerful, but even the most likable person needs to stand up for themselves, especially when you're being abused. And this is sometimes that bots often encounter, even if it sounds a bit weird. Studies have shown that um, people are more likely to dehumanize and objectify female bots. So what happens in the real world also happens in the virtual world. Um, and we may not be able to control the outcome, but we can control how the this assistance will respond to the provocations um, and how wh what type of behavior we want to encourage or disencourage. So uh, let me show you a bit of an example of some, some uh, verbal abuse that some bots have, some of these common assistants have received. And if you can see, it, this table shows you what it used to reply and what it's replying now. Uh, well, not now, 20, 2020, but three years difference. For example, um, First, when being um, insulted, so you may say, oh, I blush if I could, there's no need for that. Oh, well, that's not getting us anywhere. Thanks for the feedback even, or I don't understand. So they're being dismissive and they are, um, and they're also like giving it less importance that it actually has. So, and, and this is something that women have done for, a lot of time where you get an insult and you kind of like downplay it and joke about it to make it feel, make it go away and remove an uncomfortable situation. But we need to collectively learn how to address that 
to how to respond in an assertive way, um, be a bit more defensive and be able to, to set boundaries. Um, because the virtual world and the real world are more intertwined than we can um, every day. So we need to set that um, straight. So how do we address it? We need to be able to identify potential abuse scenarios, whether it's sexual harassment or just verbal, verbal abuse. Um, ask the women around you what type of slurs you, you may be able to get and incorporate that into the training of the bot of the bots so you can respond to it. And you need to um, set stronger boundaries to give assertive replies. So this bots used um, used to this virtual assistant used to kind of like um, dismiss that, but a better response would be to um, to say things like I won't respond to that, uh, or just um, I think it's Alexa that just shuts down when you're attacking it. So you need to start the conversation over, or please don't talk to me that way. So that sets a stronger boundary and does encourage the user to keep doing it. Okay, and a third mistake is to exclude women from the data. So AI technology is not smart on its own. It's trained with large data sets and it's fed by us humans and humans are flawed. So humans are not sexist per se, but the data that we provide to these bots to learn from might be biased. So yeah, you're, it's not that bots are sexist, is that maybe the data that we're using is, um, is not collected properly or um, yeah, it, it's just flawed. So um, for example, in 2016, uh, Google speech recognition software was found that 70%, it was 70% more likely to accurately understand male speech over female. And this is something that's happened across different speech recognition um, systems in which the woman has to like lower their voice down to to lower their pitch so it's more easily recognizable why because the system we're trained with more um predominantly with male data um also another thing that's happened it, it, it's happened also in voice commands so it happened to ford to volvo to buick that they have a similar problem with their voice command system that maybe the the woman was the one driving but it can it couldn't respond to her the same way as it did to their partners who were male so that's problematic especially if if it's something that if you're driving and you you use a voice voice interface um you can get more distracted and it comes it becomes worse another way that we find bias in in sorry, in, in natural language processing and all sorts of tools related to speech is the translators. So um, if we don't address them actively, they, these will uh, we will keep perpetuating them. For example, teacher in English can mean both female or male, but maestro, maestra in Spanish depends on gender. So there's translators where there's languages coming from neutral, um, gender neutral, uh, yeah, neutral, gender neutral languages that when translated into another, maybe the doctor will be uh, male and the nurse will be a female. So here's an example that was translated from Hungarian. It, this was 2020, no, 2021. So it was, she is beautiful, he is clever, he reads, she washes the dishes. So this task were sorted based on stereotypes, and this uh, this all comes from data that it's collected from everywhere. So there's a lot of work to do, but it's not impossible. But yeah, this is a, a way to do to um, to represent that it's everyday sexism that gets in the way. So how do we address it? Try to use sex segregated data so people are able to know. So the people who train these programs are able to reach at least a 50-50 of representation from each gender. Um, also test from a gender perspective, uh, not only test that it's functioning right, but also throw curve balls that, are, um, that may be sexist or that may be um, excluding some demographic to, be, to see if, if it still works and how it responds. And as I've been mentioning for the past few points, involve women to spot these gaps. Nothing like women to be able to tell what type of things 
we're living through. But it's not impossible to miss this, given that about 80% of AI professors are male, 88% of AI researchers are male as well. So um, we need to get women involved at all times. And it pretty much points in this direction. Just keep us in the loop, because although the conversational AI is still male dominated, we need women designers, engineers, scientists, testers, businesswomen, mentors, because they will identify harmful stereotypes, will make sure to test bias, uh, again, a bias that disadvantages them, um, proactively fix existing sexism, and make sure that they're not excluded as users. And not only female representation, but also other demographics that might become excluded from the default, like white, able, straight men, by mistake or maybe not by mistake. So just real quick, I'll tell you about a bit about women in voice, which um, given because of these problems in 2019, um, Dr. Palmatek, uh, she was in the voice space and she realized we need more women here and now because this thing, this keeps growing. So she, she founded Women in Voice, which is a global, um, global tech community focus for women in conversational technology. And there's 14 countries involved, 21 chapters across them. Um, and this, uh, that, and for Latin America, there's two chapters, Mexico, I'm leading that chapter uh, of ambassadors and Argentina who just um, got started. So we talk about convo design, voice technology, uh, linguistics, language, and women, female empowerment. Sorry, I switched to Spanish here the slides. Um, and what we do is try to create a network of women helping women uh, prepare for a career in conversational AI and also connect them with opportunities and make sure that we are taking up space. Like if we, and we do so through, so through events, trainings, mentorships, creating relationships because support networks are really important. Um, so let's say there's a panel with four male speakers, there's no excuse. Like, you know that there's a group of women together uh, a talent pool which you can pick from. So just being present and making sure we're not left behind. So if you want to learn a bit more about the community or you want to join, you can become a member. Uh, you can find us as Women in Voice MX. This is for the Mexico chapter, but there's Women in Voice Global. And these are the social um, yeah, social media that we're, we're on. And last, I want to recommend these two books. One is called Invisible Women. Uh, this one's great. It's just data bias and all over the world and everything you, you wouldn't have thought of. And The Smart Wife, which is specific to, um, to the portrayal of this, this female assistance, which is really good. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Hey, that was great. Thank you very much. I love it. Um, so we have a few questions. Gerardo, do you want to ask your question? I can also just read it. But... Yeah, yeah. So do you have any idea how these tests from a gender perspective can, can be generated? The ones that you mentioned at the last part of the uh, presentation and also is there any existing protocol i was checking i was checking this the one you showed us from uh, mm -hmm. so i was reading the the text but can you ex explain a little bit more of that okay first question was how do we test okay as of let's say like formal formal Test. I don't think. I guess it's when you're when you're. Let's say you have an agent that you're putting together, and you kind of throw in sexist stuff, and and see how it responds. Or um, yeah, that's that's what I meant by that. Okay, but is there any kind of like protocol or yeah, like a frame to do that and be like. Mm -hmm. systemize the response and, and everything or you think that it could be more flexible there must be i'm not sure like a metric but that'd be good to check i feel like this can be also very sub subjective 
because there's very like there they can be very slight like light nuances that we may not be able to detect when when people are thrown are being sexist. Um, but yeah, that's a good question, and maybe maybe I can I can look into that. We also have another question in the chat. I'm gonna read it in the interest of time because we have another talk, and then we have to move on to the most interesting part, which is you know networking everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> But the question is, is from Eduardo Alves da Silva, is there a way to use biased data sets, but enforce a deep learning model to learn unbiased features? Like to learn to detect the bias in the first place? I think the question is more like, you can correct me Eduardo if I'm wrong, but so like the data is there, but there's not much we can do about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, we should do something about it, but that's the reality how do we make the models not be biased and oh. yeah okay like the model itself Ooh, well and magdalena has her hand up maybe she has yeah a... i think that's a at least i i think that's a very technical question i i i know there are some ways of training losses to penalize that the model is doing bad in any class at all so that is if you have an imbalance of like let's say a lot of male voices or male data and but you can train the model to try to make it uh penalize that if it does bad in any of them the classes present it's a it's a no-go but i think they're very difficult to use I I haven't tried myself but like I've heard that and maybe that's the excuse why we're not using it more I don't know, Andres, if you have comments on that. I just wanted to say that my Roomba has a male name and my Siri has a male voice. So I'm really appreciating this talk. 